Welcome back. Have a little sip of tea. What I want to talk about now, so we're still in the realm of animal uh, interactions. So animals are not just mammals. Animals include arachnids like spiders, and animals include insects uh, like stinging bees and biting ants. What I want to do is talk about uh, necrotic spider bites. I've done this previously. I'm going to do it quick here. But I want to just talk about spider bites and possibly snake bites. The problem with snake bites is you just, this class is too quick to really understand all that one needs to know about snake bites. But what I want to do is I just want to separate necrotic, also called cytotoxic, and neurotoxic, spiders and snakes. The reason, by the way, that spiders and snakes and other lovely creatures, really just these two, but they are lovely. I love spiders and I love snakes. I love watching them. I don't like getting bit by them. But I think they're some of the most beautiful animals on earth. Um, but the reason that they have these venoms is because they don't chew. It's that simple. So snakes don't chew and spiders don't chew. They eat their prey and they have to liquefy their prey and they have to immobilize their prey. So when you think of snakes, I think it's funny when people think of snakes, I'm jumping to snakes here for a minute, people often think scary, scary, scary. But actually, there are some large snakes, there's 25 foot snakes, but generally they're about this large, even a large snake is this large, they're soft bodied, and actually if they weren't venomous you can pick them up, so please don't do this. Then I'm just saying, you could step on them, right? They're not, they're not cougars, they're not dogs, they're not even big cats. They are squiggly animals that are basically running away from you all the time, and they're soft bodied. I mean, if you pick them up and lasso them, so please don't. I love snakes, but I'm saying that the fear of snakes, unless they're poisonous, is actually they're pretty harmless creatures, right? And so they don't chew. And spiders, which a lot of people are even smaller, spiders are these tiny arachnids. They're not insects, so I keep calling them arachnids. These tiny creatures uh, that basically a few of them. Do a little bit, a few of them do a lot of harm to humans, just like snakes. A few of them do a lot of harm. Snakes are a whole other category. Snakes, even though I've just said that they're easy to harm, there are, there's a lot of snake damage that happens in the world every year. Um, but I just, I'm also just pointing out that what they are are not big leopards or German shepherds running after you, right? So in parts of the world like Australia and parts of India, there's definitely you have to be in Central America, constant watch for snakes. In most of the United States, there are rattlesnakes that you have to watch out for, but often they are also watch, watching out for you because you can hurt them, and so they're trying to get away, and they don't eat us. All right, so that's my preamble there. Um, so both of them liquefy their prey or, or subdue their prey. So when snakes and spiders, so I'm sorry, I'm Snakes and spiders, I'm putting together because they have two distinct kinds of venoms. One of their venoms by black widow spiders and coral snakes is neurotoxic. So by neurotoxic, it affects the nervous system. When a coral snake bites you, right, not a rattlesnake, not a copperhead, when a coral snake bites you, locally where it bit you is not a problem. It's the venom affecting your nervous system. And it's exactly the same with black widows. Where they bit you is not a big problem. It's the, all the nerve tissue near that. You have systemic effects. And so they are scary because they're systemic. They're not local. So, I'm, so those are called neurotoxins. I'm not covering coral snakes, and I'm not covering black widow spiders. So the other kind are called cytotoxins or necrotic, meaning that they break down tissue. When those things bite you, what they're doing is they're liquefying you and breaking down your body structure so they can swallow you. They do it differently. Snakes swallow you whole. They don't really swallow humans very often. But what they do is basically, with, if you've ever watched snakes, and of course I would recommend like David Attenborough in particular or other series that show snakes eating big animals, they unhinge their jaw, this is snakes, and they use their front teeth generally and drag the animal into them and then they use their muscles to keep pushing them back. And basically, they're going to crush you, even, not even just boa constrictors, but most snakes. And so they injected something in you to make that process easier, right? So it's going to help break down your tissue, but not really liquefy you. But spiders liquefy, right? They don't liquefy humans, but if you've ever looked at a spider web, 
what happens is the spider bites its prey and then it sucks it dry, which is why whenever you find those skeletons on spider webs, right, what that was is a grasshopper or a fly or a bee, whatever it was. Basically, what they did is they went up, envenomated it, which is putting venom in, envenomated or envenomed, put the venom in it, uh, and then the venom works, and basically it gets, you know, it's dead and paralyzed, and then they can basically suck it because they don't chew. So that's what's going on. Um, with spiders, they can't do that to us in large scale. Uh, they're way too small creatures. Of course, snakes can. So what I'm going to do in the name of brevity here is I'm going to say if you want to understand how to treat snake bites, and by snake bites I mean cytotoxic, rattlesnakes, copperheads, uh, take another class on it. Many people like to teach about it, but it's, it's a much bigger topic here because you can die. Uh, the reality is, just for numbers, is about one person a year in the United States dies of snake bites. One a year. That's not many. Uh, bees kill about 50, just as a comparison from anaphylaxis, which comes up next. But in the world, about 50,000 people a year die from snake bites. That's a lot. So it's important to understand snakes and their venoms. In the United States, the most common venomous snakes are the crotalids, which is rattlesnakes and copperheads, and just study them and learn because it's important to understand what's going on to prevent people from getting much sicker. Um, so now I'm going to move to the two spiders that do the most amount of harm. And they are brown recluses, and true to their name, they are reclusive, you don't see them very often, and what are called hobo spiders. Hobo spiders, uh, we can put up some photos of these, I, don't, I haven't taken any yet because they're reclusive and hobo-y. Um, but you can look online, there's lots of photos of both of these. There's probably other spiders that have this effect, but because you, we don't feel getting bit by spiders, we feel the effects later, is that nobody's quite sure which spiders affect us. Actually, black widow spiders, a very obvious, just a different one, hasn't, wasn't really known to do what it did to about 100 years ago, right? Because nobody sees the black widow spider. There's all these spiders around, so which one is creating the pain? So what I'm saying is that probably other spiders, besides brown recluses, which take almost all the blame, and hobo spiders uh, do some of this. So hobo spiders are mostly northwestern. Brown recluse spiders, their main center is Oklahoma, Missouri, and that area, Arkansas. But they, ha they do live all over the country. Uh, but that's just their epicenter. And then they, off, they set up colonies when they travel, you know, when they end up in a bill, you know, somebody's car, it ends up somebody where, somewhere else. So that's the main spiders I'm talking about. What you're also going to notice is I, I'm entranced by these things and do like talking about them, and I like watching them as well. So what happens? is you get bit by a brown recluse or a hobo or one of these other spiders. You don't know you got bit. They're chelicerae. They're little uh, things that, you know, the fang parts that go into are pretty small. Right? They're small. They're like this big, right? With legs like this big. The biggest spider, by the way, fits in your hand. None are huge. But anyway, that's a tarantula. They're about this big. You probably were cleaning a wood pile and you put your hands in the wood pile. You moved it and you disturbed the brown recluse and it bit you. Right? You probably had a rub against it. So it bites you, you don't even know you were bit. Later on, though, you might notice that your hand starts feeling swollen and your tissue starts dissolving, right? Start, dissolving is an exaggeration. Your tissue starts breaking up and you have a wound that's starting to open and get worse rather than better and you have no idea where it came from. So what's going to happen here, so I'm going to jump off track for a second, kind of on track. The majority of people, this is interesting to me, because many, many people say, I got a spider bite, and I look at that and think, you have a staph infection. And they go, well, I had a spider bite that turned into a staph infection. And I'm like, how do you know it was a spider bite? Like, well, I got bit by a spider. Did you see the spider? Did you ever see the fangs, the marks? And so many people believe that they got bit by spiders who didn't. So often in hospitals, so recently I, I read a statistic. So it's one of those things where I like the statistic because it proves my point. I'm not sure actually how accurate it is. But a majority of people that go to hospitals and say they have spider bites actually just have staph infections, probably not caused by spiders. So if somebody says they have a spider bite, don't jump to that they have a spider bite. Look at it, and then if it's a staph infection, We've talked about how to treat that, so then treat it as a staph infection. Though honestly, as we're going to learn about, it's pretty much the same treatment either way. So 
all of a sudden you think you have a spider bite. Actually, sometimes if you look with a 10 power magnifying lens, you can see the fang marks, so often you can't from spiders. Sometimes you can see tiny little holes, but you probably won't see it without uh, some help with uh, magnification. I, like initially, I showed you that I have a 10 power and a 20 power magnifying lens called a loop in my botany kit, so I'll look. But often you won't find that. And what's going to happen is the wound's just going to get worse and worse and swollen, and the venom is going to start destroying the tissue locally. It's usually not a systemic effect, it's local. If they got bit by the hands, they got bit by the cheek, if they got bit on their legs, you get bit anywhere. This is not like a dog bite. The spider bites wherever it brushes up against you and feels threatened and bites you. Um, and so if you think it is a spider bite and you just have to see enough of them and you start to see the kind of swelling, the kind of breakdown of tissue, and usually it's more than one person, right? Usually if there's a spider bite, those spiders live there and you might see a few people with this. Still, it's guesswork. So this is uh, different than other kinds of bites and stings. What you're going to do is basically just try to absorb the poisons and stimulate innate immunity. So as opposed to dog bites, spiders can put a little bit of bacteria when they bite you, but the real problem is the venom that goes into you. And if you read about it, the venoms are very interesting. So you're not really, you don't have to clean it, you don't have to do yarrow soaked, it's not going to do much. There's a tiny little puncture wound, it's, it's envenomated. It's not a bacterial infection initially, it's an envenomed infection. It's a venom, it's not really an infection, it's a venom destroying local tissue. So your goal is to try to absorb the tissue, excuse me, absorb the venom back out. And the way that you do that is an activated charcoal poultice. This is the first place, by the way, I started using activated charcoal and had pretty good results. So everything I've showed you previously and said about activated charcoal fits in right here. Get your gauze, make your slurry, paste it on, but with spider bites, get it really tight. Like, uh, it might, you might get some inflammation that pushes out, but the, the bite area is so small and so inward that you really you have to get that activated charcoal and tie it tight, like not tie it tight, but put it on so you, it's really flush, really strongly flush. I'm not sure what this, what this means. Uh, really strongly flush against there to pull out some of the venom that's in there. I hope that makes sense. So activated charcoal locally, topically, put it on there. You can put other herbs on, but activated charcoal is the main thing. Internally, you guessed it, Echinacea, buttloads of echinacea, one to two to three to four dropperfuls the first day every two to four hours, and then just like with the dog bites, then half that, then half that, but keep it up for a while. Hopefully the spider bite gets better in about two to three to four days. Uh, I've worked with it very frequently, and often you can pull them back. You can help them. The sooner you work, the better. So you want to, you know, if you want, you want to get that activated charcoal. I would say change it once a day, only once a day is necessary. Keep it flush and give the person as much echinacea as they'll swallow with OSHA. So about one part echinacea to half part OSHA. That means a lot of OSHA because it has an anti-venomous quality and a lot of echinacea and just go there. And so I've just spent uh, probably 20 minutes talking about spider bites and the treatment is actually pretty straightforward. Um, I've seen it help a bunch. When it doesn't, they might need other care. Generally, though, it doesn't get much, much, much worse, and you can just keep working with it for a while. I have worked with spider bites, besides that one where I talked about the moxa on the foot. I have worked with spider bites that are weeks old, um, and this has also helped. So basically, everything I've just said, um, and that's mostly what I have to say about spider bites. Oh, you might ask them. Did you see the spider? Because sometimes people do. Like sometimes somebody will be looking at them and they'll brush something. So they're like, what? they'll go like this without even thinking about it. And then they're like, oh, it's a spider. And like, oh, I was bit. They should, pop, they should, without getting bit again, if they can get that spider and put it in a plastic bag, you know, I would probably keep it alive because I love spiders. But if they can bring that spider to you, you can then examine it. If you know your spiders, then you don't get bit too and make sure that is a spider bite. So that's mostly it. Activated charcoal poultice locally. Lots of herbs. If there's trauma and pain, add those in. It's, sometimes there's inflammation, but it's less inflammation than a lot of necrotic tissue. So that's my talk on necrotic or cytotoxic spider bites by hobo, briar recluses, and their ilk. Thanks. Mm -hmm.